or tape, CDs, DVDs to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thursday evening, August the 31st, 1989. First service of the Labor Day weekend, teaching and deliverance camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. It's a privilege to have Brother and Sister Golden here this evening. I did not expect it, and I don't know how much they did, but it's, uh, it's a privilege to have them. And I'm going to ask Brother James to come and... Uh, speak to you for a few minutes from his heart, and I'm going to ask him to take tomorrow night's service and Saturday morning. And then I think they're probably going to have to travel after that. They have an appointment to, uh, up in Wisconsin or Michigan or someplace. But the Lord has really looked after them since we last saw them, and it's a privilege to be part of their ministry. We at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp have been part of their ministry for <laughs> what, 20 years or more down in Belize, and it's a privilege and an honor to have them to be with us. And Brother James, come on here and take your liberty. You know you. <clears throat> Say praise the Lord. <laughs> Say hallelujah. <clears throat> oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm just so very glad to be here. I'm glad that God worked it out so that we can be here. When we left Central America uh, Friday the 18th, well, uh, we paid for insurance for being in Mexico for 10 days because often it takes that long, uh, considering stopovers that we make, uh, to get up to Mexico. And if we would have taken 10 days to get to Mexico, uh, we wouldn't have been here. Uh, we expected to visit uh, friends in South Texas and uh, spend a few days with them. And we got there and found out that they had recently moved up uh, further up northward in the United States. And... Uh, so, you know, I believe, I'm, I'm making excuses, but I just believe the Lord wanted us to be here. Praise God. Hallelujah. I believe God wanted you to be here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I believe God has got something special for us in this count meeting. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Uh, you know, we might think, well, we're going to have another count meeting. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But I believe this is not going to be just another count meeting. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm just thankful for, for these campgrounds and for these people that work here and for the way God is using them. I praise God for the way that He's used them to help us and strengthen us and supply us that we can penetrate the deep, dark jungles where there really is darkness and we can see the powers of witchcraft broken and turned back and people that are bound in bondage of sin in the far corners of the globe. And if you look at them, you might compare it with Ezekiel's boneyard. Whenever uh, uh, God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? Ezekiel didn't want to say yay or nay. He didn't want to put himself out on a limb. He just said, Lord, you know whether they can or not. And uh, so people see the conditions in some of the places of the world and maybe ask, is there any hope? Can anything be done here? Well, uh, the Lord knows. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you by his power, by his grace, he can. I just thank God for power and authority in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They was here a few months back, an elderly brother and I. Uh, there was a, a lady terribly bound by demons, and uh, it kind of fell our lot to uh, minister deliverance. And uh, so I was noticing the elderly man, uh, he had a real bad case of the sniffles, and he was really tormented with, I'll call it sniffles, because he sat around with uh, Kleenex all the time, and uh, he couldn't hardly sleep. And uh, I thought, well, I've got to be courteous to this dear brother. He's much older than I am. I'm a younger. I've got to be subject to the elder. And I can't afford just to go lay hands on him and rebuke that spirit that's bothering him. So we went home, went to bed, and went to sleep. So I got a real good night's sleep that night. I got up the next morning, and he says, Brother, he said, you really brought deliverance to me last night. I did. He said, 
How'd that happen? He said, what you said in the middle of the night. What did I say in the middle of the night? He said, you stop that right now in the name of Jesus. And he says, after that, you said it again louder and more firm. He said, brother, you have really got power and authority in Jesus. He says, I went out. I didn't want to vomit over these people's floor, but I went out and it all went away and I got delivered. Well, I didn't know anything at all about it. I was, I was just getting a good night's rest. And you know, I just praise God that we can rest in the Lord. It's not our struggle, it's God's struggle. What God's going to give to you, it's not because you're such a good struggler. It's just because you can open up and receive. Hallelujah. The Lord knows how to enlarge our capacity. On December the 22nd, we were what we thought was our last day of being in Mexico, or going back to Mexico, December the 22nd last year. And we had been here for Thanksgiving. And uh, our van slid off of the road and went over a, an embankment. And uh, it was quite demolished, and we were, I was pretty severely injured, and uh, stayed on the side of the road for, oh, how long? About 24 hours before being able to get to the hospital. X-rays later revealed there was a big glob of blood where I'd bled on the inside, fractured some ribs. But when we did get to a place where uh, we could uh, have a, go to a phone, I wasn't able to go to a phone, but my darling wife, she went and began calling different places. And about the first place she called was Lake Hamilton Bible Camp. And uh, I was thinking, you know, my condition, the way it was, uh, you'd think you're going to have to be in hospital several days in a condition like that. So uh, my wife related to me how the conversation went. And when she related it to me, I knew it was a message from God. Brother Glenn had told her that I'm, I'm going to pray and he's going to be able to go home tomorrow. Well, hallelujah. So we uh, made phone calls. We, I didn't have no, nothing to go home in. And, and, and that close to Christmas, you can't even hardly get a foot on a bus in Mexico. But God worked it out. And some dear friends of ours from Belize came up and, and uh, got us and got our things that was in the van. And uh, I got to spend Christmas with my grandchildren. They couldn't understand why Grandpa couldn't pick them up and hug them like he had before. But... Anyhow, uh, I just thank God for the way he came on the scene and blessed us and helped us in those times of need. Glory to God. And I want to tell you, Brother Glenn, and all of you that work here at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, and all of you that come in and put forth your efforts, I greatly appreciate each and every one of you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, i tell you what. You ever hear the expression, you know, so-and-so is going to happen? I can feel it coming on. Glory to God. I believe God's got some real good word for us here tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. And what I've said, I hope it, that rather than distracting you from what God is going to say to us tonight through the preaching of the word, I hope I've uh, helped you to, instead of having your cup, you know, here's my cup, Lord, but having it turned upside down, you got it right side up. You got it under the spout where the glory comes out. God bless you. It's very good to be here. And I'm going to turn the service now back over to our master of ceremony. Thank you, Brother James. And we'll be hearing from you tomorrow evening and uh, some more and in the morning. Not tomorrow morning, but Saturday morning. Amen. And it's a privilege to have Chip and Darlene Hill here with us this evening. We had just met them for the first time uh, personally, talked to them a few times, wrote to them, uh, got to know them through their book that we picked up up in Springfield when we were up there, and uh, some of those uh, things that's in here are, are things that uh, are dear to our hearts, and uh, he's written, got one book published called Kingdom Commandos, and uh, yeah, we need to learn to be a kingdom commando for the Lord, and, and that's what uh, our purpose is in being here, that we learn how to, to fight for the things that concern the kingdom. And uh, to learn how to put Satan underfoot and to set the captives free. So, Chip, if you'll turn that thing on there and you can come and introduce Darlene if, and yourself. And it's a pleasure to have you. Amen, amen. Praise you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your anointing to flow over to, uh, the ministry this evening. 
as the word of the Lord comes forth, and may our hearts be open, and may we receive uh, from thee that which uh, you have placed, Lord, for us to have tonight. And I thank you for it, and I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm not going to use this. Okay, it's all going through there. All right. Praise God. Well, she's good. Good. Well, darling, come on up. It's great to be with you all. We're from the mountains of Virginia, and I want to tell you it's a real mission field right there. Yeah. Uh, we've been to Africa on several occasions, and but I'll tell you, you can go to Africa, and in Africa you can preach Mary had a little lamb, and the people come forward by the dozens and by the hundreds. But you get into the mountains of Virginia and West Virginia, where's Brother Bill? <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you've been back to West Virginia for a while, but it's tough. And uh, But it's just good. It's so good to come here among people that are so receptive to the things that the Lord wants to, to do. And I'm looking forward to talking to Brother and Sister Golden about what's happening down there because my heart is in missions. And it better be because that's where we are. That's right. But this is Darlene. The Lord blessed me with her in 1976. And we have two sons. And this is the greatest woman of God that I know. And I feel like, I feel like, I feel sorry for any man of God that can't say that about his own wife. But anyway, I'd just like her to take a minute or two to just say if there's anything on her heart to say. Maybe how she feels about just being here. Well, I just greet you in the name of Jesus. Um, you know, I learned a lot in going to Africa the couple of times that we've been. And that is that God delights in variety in his people. And... Uh, we go different places, and you know, everybody's different. Every group worships different, but the, every group talks about different things. But the Holy Spirit's there. You know, you get together, and you can just feel the love of God. You can feel uh, the Holy Spirit just kind of waiting to move on the people. Uh, it's just good. So I just praise the Lord. I just know that something good is going to happen during this camp meeting. I've been excited about it every time, ever since we heard that we were supposed to come here. And uh, I just got my faith on the line that this is going to be great, that you guys are going to go home with your needs met. You're going to go home with a renewed vision, with a renewed zeal, and that you're going to go home with something practical to beat the devil over the head with. Yes. Amen. And win in Amen. the name of Amen. Jesus. Amen. 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 That's right. Well, glory to God. It's fun. Isn't it fun to be in the kingdom of God? Amen. Amen. We're a kingdom people. Yes. You know, we serve a king. And if you serve a king, uh, you don't live in a democracy. And thank God, you know, we live in a democracy here in this country. But we are citizens of a higher kingdom, a higher calling. And he's a king and we're part of the kingdom. We're subjects to a king. Yes. Praise God. And that's one reason I wrote Kingdom Commandos is because... It's time for us to begin to look at ourselves as, quote, spiritual Rambos for Jesus. Amen. I don't know if you ever heard of Rambo or not, but Rambo was a big movie that the kids were really into not long ago, I guess over the last four or five years. And uh, the actor, Sylvester Stallone, plays the most highly trained special service man that the Army ever created and set forth against the enemy. And in uh, one of the movies, he goes in behind enemy lines where POWs are held in bondage. He, he seeks them out. He finds where they are. And when his commander says, just take pictures, he says, just take pictures. You know, religion will tell you just to take pictures. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm just very unethical when it comes to religion. I, I just can't stand religion because it's death. It's, it's, the Bible in Isaiah calls it strong drink. It puts you to sleep. It puts you into a slumber. But in this movie, he'll go in and he finds the captives. And he sneaks in. And he sets every one of the captives free. But not only does he do that, but he demolishes the stronghold that held them captive. And I saw that movie because I'm a violent guy. You know, I don't, I don't go in for warfare with it. You know, I mean... You know, I feel like that if an invading force from overseas comes and wants to take over America, then I'll take up a gun. You know, you might have trouble with that. I'll take up a gun. I, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. But what did he say if somebody smacks someone you're given authority to protect? Well, if somebody come in and try to do something to my wife or kids, they're going to have to get through me first. 
Amen. Amen. I love them. But anyway, I, I didn't mean to get off on this, brother. I'm not... I, I'm just telling you, I'm a violent person. But see, the Bible says, Jesus said this. He said, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Amen. Okay, we're not to be a bunch of wimps when it comes to Christianity. We're to get out there, and we're to find out where the captives are, where the devil's been holding them in bondage, and bless God, set them free in the name of Jesus, and give God all the glory and praise. Amen. That's why it just thrills me to be able to come here among a bunch of you all and see my brother over here and then hear what you all are doing down there. That just thrills me. So we're going to have a great time. A great time. We're kingdom commandos. And you know, in order for us to be kingdom commandos, in order for us to be able to set others free, we have to be free first. And I've found, I found uh, through my own life a lot of the keys that are necessary for us to, to be free ourselves. And I know that if you've been coming to this camp for any time at all, if this is not your first time, then you too have found how to be free. You're finding more ways to be free. And you're, uh, you're also becoming more inflamed with the vision of setting the captives free. Because people all over the body of Christ even, not just the world, but all over the body of Christ are bound. They're bound and they don't even know it. And uh, Derek Prince said something one time that really got me to thinking. And, you know, I've studied it ever since then, and I agree with him. But he says there's more witchcraft in America than there is in any other nation on earth. It might not come in the, it might not come in the form of a witch doctor or a, a, a group of sorcerers in Africa, like is in Africa. It might not be that way here. But the kids in this country are bound by rock music. They're bound by the occult. They're bound by drugs. They're bound by promiscuous sex. They're bound by the slop offerings of Hollywood over the TV or through the movies. They're bound. I'll tell you what, I know they're bound because I was one of them. When I was 19 years of age, the day I graduated from high school, I woke up that morning with tremendous pain in this wrist. Never had had it before in my life. Had no idea what it was, but it was an awful pain, a, a gripping pain. And I was kind of worried because I knew that I would have to shake hands with the principal, who was a strong man, as I received my, uh, as I received my diploma. You know, in, in graduation, you, with your left hand, you receive your diploma, and with your right hand, you reach over across and shake the hand. And I was worried. I wasn't a Christian then, by the way. But I, I was very much worried because Mr. Moon, as his name was, it was, he had a strong grip, very athletic man. Well, by the time graduation services came along that night, I was so drunk that it didn't matter to me, and the pain had gone. So I didn't have anything to worry about. Well, the next day, there was pain in this wrist. And I was, I was worried because I had a lot of hay to put up. I'm a farmer. I've raised beef, cattle, and sheep ever since I was 16, 17 years of age with my father. And of course, he's gone away now, and I, we got out of farm, and when we went into full-time ministry, but the Lord still has blessed us with a 93-acre farm in the mountains of Virginia. And uh, so my, my livelihood depended on strength. I needed to be strong to be able to handle the hay bales and all of the different things that a beef cattle farmer and a, and a sheep farmer needs to do. But pain began to hit me that summer. I'll never forget it. It was the summer of 71. Summer of 71. Pain was hitting me in my, in my shoulder one day. And the next time it was in my elbow. The next time it was in my knee, my wrist, my hands, my knuckles. And I went to the doctor. And he told me that I had a severe case of rheumatoid arthritis. And here I was, 19 years of age. And a severe case of rheumatoid arthritis. One of the most dreaded diseases, I think, that is ransacking the human race. Uh, there are many other diseases, but this is something that is so debilitating and so so terrible, especially for a fellow like I was. Now, I'm not big, but I was a weightlifter in high school, and I was one of the strongest guys in the school. Not because I was big, but because I worked so hard. And I think a lot of weightlifting is up here. If you know you can bench press 250 pounds, and some guy who outweighs you 100 pounds doesn't know he can do it, you're going to beat him because you know you can do it. And that's the way I was. But all of a sudden, at 19 years of age, I was being wiped out by this ruthless killer, this ruthless, merciless crippler called rheumatoid arthritis. And all of a sudden, despair just swept into my heart, swept into my mind, and I began to lose all hope. 
I can remember one time sitting in my car with a girlfriend outside of a, a dance or a ball game one night, and, and I can remember just weeping on her shoulder because it looked like my future. All I wanted to be and do was just going out the window. This arthritis was crippling me. Then I was born again. By the mercy and grace of God, Jesus came to me in January 1974, and I got down on the throw rug in my grandmother's attic bedroom. It was my sister, who had been a drug addict, just gotten saved, gotten hung around, hanging around with all these uh, tongue talkers. I didn't understand any of it. She, I heard she wanted to talk to me. I didn't want to listen to it. And I got down on my knees with her. I ended up getting on my knees with her the first time I saw her after she had been saved. And I accepted the same Lord she had accepted a month earlier. As a matter of fact, I was her first convert. <laughs> my faithful sister. But anyway, got down on my knees, received Jesus, but the arthritis was still there. A month later, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, prayed in other tongues, but the arthritis was still there. And for a year, the gloom and the doom and the pain haunted my life, and, and I was told I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was 30. Then one day I was riding home from a ball game, and I turned the radio on in my little Datsun pickup, and I heard R.W. Shambach. <laughs> and Shambach was saying, you don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. And, you know, something just shot through my spirit. Oh, I love that. And he, he offered Power Magazine at the end of the, the radio broadcast. And he, I got that about a month later because I subscribed right away and I got that a month later and the first article was on Isaiah 53 4 and 5 surely he hath borne your sicknesses and carried your pains and with his stripes you're healed and and also about the whole armor of God wherewith you if you take the shield of faith you will be able to quench not some of the fiery darts all the fiery darts of the wicked one and and I learned the prayer of faith Mark 11 20, uh, Mark 11 24 what things soever you desire when you pray believe that you receive it and you'll have it and so I began to walk in that. I began to walk in faith for my healing. And God began to give me a measure of that healing. But there was something lacking. And that's what many of you folks are all about and believe in. And thank God you do because so many of the segments of Christianity are letting this vital ministry fall by the wayside. But there were demon spirits that were plaguing my life. I was a Christian. Yes, I was a Christian. Jesus was in my heart. I loved him. I wasn't possessed, but I was being oppressed. I was being vexed. I was being crippled. I was being tormented. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture in the book of 2 Corinthians where Paul says that if you receive another gospel, you receive another Jesus, and you also receive another spirit. And he's writing to spirit-baptized Christians. It's a possibility to receive another spirit. And I was being crippled by this arthritis. And the way the arthritis had originally come into my life was through a, an extreme spirit of criticism. See, I was raised in a very critical home. I learned how to be critical from my grandparents, from my parents, from my friends, from my aunts, my uncles. It was just bred into me. I was a very critical, unforgiving, resentful person. If you ever did anything wrong to me, then you were on my hate list from then on. And a good test for you, if you've got any problem with joints, any, any of the pain or twisting or swelling or gnarling in your joints, then you need to really examine yourself concerning this bitterness. And a good test, a good test is whenever someone says something nice about someone that you resent, do you automatically throw up something, a list of their, their wrongs? You know, a lot of times that's what we'll do. You know, if, if, if someone were to say to Darlene, Darlene, you know, I think that uh, Joe Blow is a wonderful guy, don't you? Yes, but. Yes, but. Yes, but let me tell you this. Now, that's a pretty good indication that you, you've got resentment towards that person and you need to get it out. And that's the way I was. I wouldn't say, yeah, but. I'd say, no, he stinks. <laughs> and let me tell you why. And I'd read the riot act about this guy or this woman or whoever it was. I was filled with bitterness. Filled with it. Well, I began to learn about the ministry of deliverance. This was all back in the early 70s. And I cast out that spirit of, of bitterness. 
And I was, all of a sudden, a greater measure of healing began to take place in my life. All the while I'm confessing, by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. By Jesus' stripes I'm healed. I learned early in life to walk the floor and confess, by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. I think I heard Kenneth Copeland say one time, and, I, and I'm not into these formulas, okay? I'm not a faith formula guy, you know, because I tell you what, formulas, they, they'll work if you know the God of formulas. But a lot of people don't know the God of formulas. These things, you know, God's not... God doesn't do it because it's right. When He does it, it is right. And He doesn't go by a standard. He is the standard. And we need to understand that. But I learned early to walk the floor back and forth and confess the Word. I think I heard Ken Copeland say one time years ago that he walked the floor. One night he was in a motel room in, I think, Little Rock, Arkansas. I think that's where it was. And he said that he had a, the symptoms of the flu coming on him, and he walked the floor for about two hours one night, and he confessed, by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. And he said when he got about to about the 582nd time, the power of God hit him, came down over the back of his head, shot down through his body, and drove out every symptom of, of the flu. Well, I tried to do that too. You know, I thought I was going to manipulate God, and well, it did, he did it for Ken, so he's going to do it for me. And I tried to confess the word, and I got to 582, and nothing happened. <laughs> So I went on for another 582, and I learned that just because you do some formula, that isn't going to always guarantee success. You've got to know the God of formulas. You've got to know what He's requiring of your life. You've got to make sure that you're, you're walking by the rule that He's given you. Uh, go with me, if you would, to Philippians. I, I better go ahead and open the Word, because Philippians chapter 3, verse 16. Somehow... I'm going to let this lead into what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. But I feel like I'm kind of circling the airport, figuring out which direction the Lord wants me to fly in. And now, I think we're going to get to a subject tonight that's going to be it's going to hit a lot of you. It's going to really hit all of us. But before we do, Philippians 3.16, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. So you can press all the formula buttons you want to press and quote all the scriptures you want to quote and even command all the evil spirits you want to command. But in, if you're not living and ordering your life by the knowledge of what God expects of you, what he's, you've already attained concerning that knowledge, and if you're not walking by the rule and minding the things of God with your heart, then a lot of those wonderful, precious formulas and faith scriptures, they're not going to work for you like they should. You've got to get serious with God. We're not related to formulas and verses. We're related to a person. We're related to a person, Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something. If none of these formulas worked, I would still love Him. And I would still spend my life for Him. Because he's worth it. You can go over, if you want, to the book of Exodus. And go to chapter 15. And I'll read a verse that probably every one of you could quote. Or if not quote it, you've heard it. And it's the one, it's the verse, verse 26 of Exodus 15, where, where God says that I am Jehovah Rapha. Or I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now thank God he is. Oh, hallelujah. He's the Lord that heals us. He's the Lord that healed Brother Golden. He's the Lord that healed... I could probably get a number of you to raise your hands. He's the God that healed me from arthritis. Hey, I was told I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was 30. I'm 37, almost 38. And I'm far from a wheelchair. And I want to tell you something else. By the grace of God, I'll never be there. I'll never go there. I'm not going to let the devil put that one off on me. And sometimes you have to get loud and mean, and you have to tell him, you're not putting that on me. I've got authority over this body. You don't. Jesus is Lord over this body. And I'm not going to let you just come in here and run roughshod over me and do whatever you want to with me. See, too many people are do allowing him to do that, and too many Christians are allowing him to do it. But they don't understand how they ought to live. They don't know how to be free. They don't know how to walk in the victory that Jesus has made available. Christ has, re has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And did you know that in Deuteronomy 28, one of the curses listed is inflammation. 
And that's exactly what arthritis is. It's inflammation of the joints. I don't care what kind of inflammation it is. It might be, uh, you know, there's phlebitis. People have problems with the veins and circulation in their legs. That's inflammation. Any, any disease that has an itis at the end of it, that's inflammation. And the Bible says in Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's a part of the curse that you're redeemed from. You don't have to be inflamed. You don't have to have it. And if you experience it tonight, if you're experiencing it at all tonight, I'm telling you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be free. But I want to tell you, it doesn't come easy. There's some things that God's going to require of you. There's some conditions. I had to stop drinking. I had to stop chewing tobacco. Now, the healing was there. It was trying to happen. God was giving it. It was coming. I was believing. My believing was bringing it in. But there was something hindering it. And God began to show me critical spirit. I had hate. I had wrath. The Bible says that the wrath of man work, does not work the righteousness of God. And see, the righteousness of God was trying to bring healing to me. You know, God gives us His righteousness, it says in the book of Romans. But did you know it says... And with this righteousness, well, I'm getting so far ahead of myself. I'm just having, I'm going in every direction, Brother Glenn. I feel like I'm exploding. Uh, I'm going to get there. Exodus 15, I am the Lord that healeth thee, right at the end of verse 26. But see, many people want to confess that. Oh, he's the Lord who heals me. He's Jehovah Rapha. We sing songs about Jehovah Rapha. But we ignore the first part of the verse. If you will diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put, or as uh, Young's Helps and Hints and Bible Interpretation says, I will permit none of these diseases which I have brought upon the Egyptians on you, for I am the Lord that heals thee. But see, we want to focus on the last part, confessing, he's my healer, singing, he's my healer, but we don't want to obey the first part of this verse. And I'm telling you, you have to. Yes. Particularly, the older you get in the Lord and the more knowledge you attain in the Lord. Remember what he said over in Philippians 3.16? Walk by that rule. What you've already attained, walk by that. Order your life by that. Mind that. It's a responsibility that we have there. There was a time when God said, cut out the caffeine. Now, I'm not against, here to preach against caffeine. Because I realize that many people can drink tea and coffee and Coca-Cola's every day of their life for the rest of their life, and it might not ever bother them. But some people can't take the gaff as long as others. And that was one of the things that was hindering the healing power of God from coming to me, as I was a caffeine addict. So God began to deal with me about many different areas. See, I was walking for health and healing. I was standing on the Word, confessing the Word. I'd had deliverance. And any time the Lord would tell me that I needed more deliverance, I'd say, what is it, Lord? I'm ready. I'm not too proud. You know, I was, I was desperate. And then there was still a blockage. There was still blo something blocking the power of God. And, and so Darlene and I, one night we began to pray for wisdom. And you know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that wisdom is profitable to direct. So the nature of wisdom is that, is that it's directive. And I need a direction. Lord, if I'm missing it, I'm missing God, I know you don't miss it. I'm missing it somewhere, Lord. I, I, I checked for strife again, unforgiveness. No, I've forgiven everybody. I'm not talking about people. Uh, I'm confessing the word. I believe, I believe, Lord, I believe. If anybody believes that you healed me when you hung on that cross, it's me. I mean, I have conf I've preached this word, I've written this word, I've written it in books and in tracts and things, and, and I believe with all of my heart that by Jesus' stripes, Chip Hill was healed 2,000 years ago as the Son of God hung on that cross. I was healed, and I believe it just as surely as I believe my sins were taken away. But something, Lord, is not working right. You don't miss it. I miss it. What is it? See, I was asking for wisdom. And then the Lord began to deal with me about some areas of my diet. We were talking at supper tonight about some of the old dietary laws of, in the Old Testament. You know, they're good ideas. They're good ideas. Now, you don't need to get under some kind of bondage, you know, a legalism type thing. But I'm telling you, there's some good ideas. And, and God didn't say, leave this alone or leave that alone in the Old Testament just because he was being mean. 
any more than he tells us in the New Testament, stay away from sin just because he's being mean. No. See, some, some areas of sin, you can get into sin, and it can be fun, but it'll kill you. And you need to know that. It'll kill you. We were listening to a tape not long ago by a brother, and he said the Lord's told him to tell young people wherever he goes, tell young Christians, if you ever get into drugs, if you ever try wrong sex, if you ever try alcohol, you might like it. And if you like it, you might never come back to the, to the Lord. And I'll tell you what, Darlene and me, have, we, we have seen that. I have seen that. She's seen that. You've seen that. We've seen young people that started off with the Lord stray into try sin. Just try it one time. You know, just try it one time. Everybody's doing it. You know, it can't hurt to try it. And the Lord is saying in this hour that even if you try it, the danger is that you might like it. And never come back. All over, all over this country right now, there are kids that were brought up in Christian families who have gone out and have tried the sin the devil offers them, the world offers them, and they are, sad to say, some of them are forever gone from the Lord. Because the power out there is so strong today. It's stronger, I believe it's stronger now than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Satan is shooting his best shot. He's pulling out his greatest war plans. He's getting his big guns out. And I want to tell you, it's not time to fool around with the devil. It's, it's time to get out of the world, get out of it totally, and live totally for the King of Kings because he's coming soon. And it's going to get bad before he comes. That's why it says in Hebrews 11:7 that we're to be like Noah who prepared an ark of safety for his family because he saw things not... He, he could see... He, he believed and he heard and he saw things that weren't seen as yet by the people of the world. And we see that tough times are coming. It's not going to be easy. It's getting rough out there. And it's time for the Christians to tie together like never before. Because you're not going to make it on your own. You're not going to make it on your own. You're not going to make it if you go flirt with the world a little bit. I want to tell you, it'll get on you. And if it gets in you, you've had it. Well, anyway. Turn with me, if you would, to... Book of Proverbs. I think I'm settling down a little bit. I'm going to. I want to talk to you tonight briefly. I don't know what time you, your night meetings usually close down. Um, Brother Glenn? Oh, is that right? Oh, boy, y'all are like the Africans. The Africans, you go over there and they'll wear you out preaching. My goodness. They're the only people I've ever seen that'll come sit on hard wooden benches through eight meetings every day for eight days. And when you've given all you can give, they're wanting more. See, they're not, they're not wanting to run home and watch Dynasty. And I want to tell you, if you watch Dynasty, you're going to die nasty. They're not wanting to run home and watch... I don't even know the names of the shows out there. Just because they don't, they have no attraction to me, huh? The ten o'clock news. The ten o'clock news. Well, anyway, I want to talk to you a little bit. Somebody has asked me before, what, what qualifies you to talk about old age or growing older? Because you know, after all, you're only thirty-seven, almost thirty-eight. You know, you've only got it. I'm just a boy. I know it. I know. And when you were up here being introduced, I thought of Leviticus nineteen thirty-two that about honoring the hoary head, the gray hair, and, yeah, you know, and, and, and rising up before the face of the old man or woman and calling them blessed and all that. And I was just thinking, it's an honor to be in your presence. It's just an honor. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, whenever I can get around a saint of God who's lived many more years than I have and I, and I detect an anointing on their life, I always like to get them to pray for me because there's a deposit of something that's held them straight to Jesus, you know, that I can receive. And, uh, well, anyway, I want to talk to you tonight about growing old in righteousness. Because I feel like, I feel like we're all growing old in righteousness. And I want to talk to you about the importance of that. And I want to talk to you a little bit about 
how you can make it the best, these the best years of your life. I don't believe that the Christian life is to be some sort of anticlimax. I don't think that, I don't think the promises of God, such as Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5, that says, Surely He hath borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. And He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement to obtain peace for us was on Him. And with His stripes ye were healed until you turned 70. <laughs> Tradition says garbage like that. Christ hath redeemed you from the curse of the law, unless you're in your senior years. I am the Lord that healeth thee until you're about 60. <laughs> or 50 or 40. God didn't say these things, did he? And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee until you get... <coughs> to be about 45. He doesn't say things like that. We put that interpretation on that. That's, you know, I, I don't like to hear somebody say, well, I've lived my 70 years and I guess it's time for me to go on now. I've lived my 70 years because, I mean, after all, the Bible says we get 70 years or if by reason of strength, 80. Doesn't it say that in Psalm 92? But you need to understand, and you look in your Amplified Bible, if you, the footnote, that's a lamentation. Moses is lamenting the fact that the people of God are dropping dead at 70 and 80 years of age. See, he remembered back in Genesis 6, 4, My spirit, God said, shall not always strive with man, nevertheless his days shall be 120 years. Why not shoot for the best? I believe 120 years is what it is. That's why Caleb, when he was... Caleb at 85 said, I'm ready to take the mountain. He said, I'm as strong at 85 as I was when I was 40. Praise God. Amen. And, that's, and then there you had Moses at 120. He climbed to the top of Mount Nebo and looked off into the promised land. And the Bible says, in that day, his eye was not dim nor his natural force abated. So I believe, I don't care. I don't care if all you fine folks die before you reach 120. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot for 120. Amen. So you can say, who do you think you are, you young whippersnapper? You've only lived 36 years. You wait till... My mother told me. My mother told me. She says, wait till you get to be 63. <laughs> she went out the door and we had a fit. That's right. I reject that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to listen to that. Why? Because I've got the Word of God. And I'm not coming, please understand, I'm not coming from cockiness and pride. Because I've, God's dealt with me through that. I've seen what pride do. I, I, you know, pride cometh before a fall. I understand that. But when, it, when the devil opens his mouth and tells you that it's got to be something less than the Word of God, you have every right, as a matter of fact, you have the responsibility to reject it, not only for yourself, but also for all those people that you'll minister to because you do live longer. Yeah. Don't you sell yourself short. God's for you. He's not against you. Now in Proverbs, oh boy, are we having fun? Amen. Amen. Well, do you think you like me? Yeah. Okay, I'm glad. I, was, I wanted to make sure we got along, okay? Proverbs 16, 31. See, I'm just, I'm, young, I'm wild and I'm just a young whippersnapper. I just can't wait till I get to be Brother Glenn's age. I'm going so, to be wilder than 40 bats. Aren't I? <laughs> and then when I get to be his mama's age, woo, man. And I'm going to. They said I wouldn't. But I've, I've made up my mind I'm going to defy the devil. Amen. I'm going to defy him. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to burn out. I'm going to burn on, praise God. And when I do go out, I'm going out in a blaze of glory. Because I know that's how Jesus is coming back, in a blaze of glory. Praise God. All right, Proverbs 16, 31. The hoary head is a crown of glory. The gray head is a crown of glory. Circle the big word, if. It's a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. What's the way of righteousness? Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
all over this country, there are people who are who are getting gray hair. I am, you know. Uh, it's a crown of glory. Praise God. It is. But they're all over this world. They're trying to cover it up. They're ashamed of it. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Trying to cover it up or, or they're, they're going and having facelifts. All these expensive cosmetic procedures. I mean, they're doing everything they can. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do any of that. But if, if you're doing it in, a, in an effort to postpone old age because you're ashamed of old age, you're afraid of old age, you're off base. Because old age should be a time when you should shine with the glory of God. Should be a time when you shine from your place in God. At the, the years that you've been able to walk with Him and grow with Him, it's a time when you can be a godly reservoir of wisdom and knowledge and strength and power and anointing for the generations to come. Hallelujah. So, don't ever be ashamed of the gray hair. My mama in Jesus, my, my spiritual mama, just died two days ago. She was a deliverance minister. She and her husband, he's still alive. He's 87, going strong. Learned to water ski about three or four years ago. <laughs> See, Helen, Helen Wallace. Anybody ever heard of Helen and Hal Wallace? They're known, they're pretty well known. People have come to them from all over the United States for deliverance for many years. They were written in the back of Don Basham's book, Deliver Us From Evil, as people that were available to minister deliverance. And so people called them constantly and were always in their home for deliverance. And they were very, very, very fond of Brother Glenn and, and Sister Irma, even though they had never met them. And Helen was so pleased when she heard that I had been invited to come speak. She was so pleased, so pleased. Well, she died. Twenty-two years ago, she was dying with pec, uh, angina pectoris. The doctor said she had to die. She had had... 200 angina pectoris attacks in the course of six years because she, she knows that they had because she had taken 200 nitroglycerin pills. One every time she had an attack and she was told she was going to die. One night, Hal, my spiritual father, he, he's 87, came home from teaching school back then, 22 years ago. And the doctor said, expect to find Helen on the floor dead any time now. Her heart is just, she can't take it. The attacks are too strong and too close together. Expect to find her dead any time. Well, Hal, Hal, that night, was out in his living room arguing with God. He said, oh God, now he was, a, he was a good Presbyterian, that's all. He was saved. He believed in Jesus, but that's it at this point. And he said, oh God, he said, Helen's a good woman. And I love her, and you love her. And if you don't do something, she's going to die. And he said God spoke to him just as clear in the middle of the night. Well, if you ask me, I'll heal her. And so Hal got up and he walked on back into the bedroom and he, and he said, Helen, I believe if I pray for you, God will heal you. And she said, you know, Hal, I believe he will. Hal didn't know how to pray. He'd never had any teaching on how to pray. All, but it, he said God put the words in his mouth and he laid hands. He didn't even know to lay hands on her. He laid hands on her and said, Oh God, take this angina from Helen in Jesus' name. See, the power is in the name of Jesus. And immediately she was healed. And not only was she healed, he was healed of arthritis and hemorrhoids. See, the Bi he didn't know that the Bible says, Pray ye one for another that ye may be healed. He didn't know that. And for 22 years, this couple, immediately they got involved in full gospel businessmen. And immediately they began to host in their home. They began to have all of the great speakers of the early days of full gospel businessmen stay in their home and teach them. Don Basham taught them deliverance. Derek Prince did. They had men like Jerry Savell come through, stay with them. They had men, even Hobart Freeman, back before he got a little bit overboard. Um, they had, uh, I can't even name the number of people. And for years they walked in power ministry. But she died two days ago. And I, I was torn because they wanted me to preach her funeral. Even though I was her spiritual son, I was also her pastor. But Hal and several and, and their natural children, who are all born again, they said, Mama would have a cow <laughs> if you missed going to Lake Hamilton. You see, she always wanted to come here and speak. 
I know you didn't. You didn't. And, and, and it wasn't God. It wasn't for her to come. But she, when she found out I was coming here to speak, she said, oh, boy, I get to go in you. Because, see, she, we sat at her feet for days and years and years and years and just sat there and just drank in the life of God and the Word of God. That's the vision that I... She gave me a vision for what old age is to be. I'm not going to sit in a rocking chair somewhere and dawdle away the days. I want to be a reservoir like Helen Wallace was to me. A reservoir of godly counsel and wisdom to the younger generations. I mean, after all, by the time I'm 77 or 78, which she was, by the time I'm her age, I will have had all these years of walking with Jesus and le making mistakes and learning from my mistakes and le learning the Word and being around people who can, you know, men who've walked ahead of me and can tell me and teach me and lay hands on me and pray for me. I, the experience and the years that I'll have. Oh, man, what a wonderful time old age is going to be for, the, for me as I give to the younger people. What a great opportunity. Right now, they don't want to hear me too much. But I'm finding out the older I get, the more respect I get. Boy, when I first started preaching, it was tough, particularly in those old dead religious hills of West Virginia and Virginia. Oh, my goodness. Talk about witchcraft. My goodness, you haven't ever been to a part of the country that's got witchcraft until you've been to West Virginia and some of the mountains of Virginia. It's terrible. We tried to start a church down in south central West Virginia. Don't get mad at me, Brother Bill. But I, I'm telling you the truth. We tried to start a church down in South Central West Virginia a couple of years ago, and I about got my head ate off. I mean, the power of witchcraft there was so strong, I wasn't ready for it. And I had to, sad to say, I had to just tuck my head and tuck my tail between my legs and go back home. I went back a defeated man, didn't I? I got into such bondage and Jezebel spirits there that I never dreamed were anywhere around us. And you see, in our area of Virginia, in, in our county, see, I have waged war against the principalities and powers in heavenly places ever since I learned that I could do that. And that's been 15 years now. And we've gone out and I walk up and down my road and I just pray in the spirit and I pray and I come against anything the Lord tells me to come against. Why, well, I was coming against the spirit of Baha'ism one night. This antichrist, godless spirit of the Baha'i faith came into our county through a bunch of their disciples, and they began to set up shop. And I didn't like it. And that night I was out on the road praying in tongues, and I was, and I was praying in tongues because I needed wisdom on what to do. And God said, I want you to bombard that spirit and kick him out of here. He said, I'm Lord over this county. You've declared it for years that I'm Lord over Highland County, and I want you to get rid of him. So after about an hour of praying in the spirit... Holy indignation came over me, and I pointed my finger right up into the heavens, and I said, You foul spirit of Baha'ism, you antichrist spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I curse you, and I command you, come down out of your position of authority over this county. You don't have a position of authority because Jesus is Lord here. Now come down right now, and immediately, the Lord let me see a meteorite flash through the sky, a brilliant, most brilliant I've ever seen. And it landed in the field right next to me. Now, that wasn't that spirit, but the Lord said, that is a sign, son. That was a, a natural sign of what happened in the spirit when you did that. And you know, ever since then, that group has dwindled away into nothing but a joke. And when I wrote about it in Kingdom Commandos, what few were left got mad at me. And some of the Christians got mad at me for writing it. But I don't care. I'm not, a, I'm not out here to powwow with the enemy. We powwowed with the devil too long. It's time to go walk right into his grounds and kick his teeth down his throat and bash his head in in the name of Jesus. Amen. Take the sword of the Spirit and rip him to shreds. Amen. Praise God. We've got to stop being mamby-pamby. We're violent warriors. We don't take up guns and missiles. We take up the sword of the Spirit. We take up the, the prayer language God's given us. We take up righteous decrees. The Bible says in Job 22:28. Talking to us, you shall also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. You know what a decree is? It's, a, it's an authoritative order backed with the force of law. And the law, of course, is the laws of God. The name of Jesus. Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. 
We're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, and we don't play games with them. We war against them and pull them down. Exodus 15, 3 says that our God is a man of war. So are we. You're a man or a woman of war, and it doesn't matter how old you are. You can be young or you can be old. Praise God. You can whip the devil. Hal Wallace is 87, and he said the other day, he said, you know these demons, he said, we ought to just wring their necks. That's his attitude. Praise God. 87 years old. And he isn't a bit, you know, he's sad to lose Helen, but he knows where she is. He, he's rejoicing in that because she fought long and hard. She defied doctors for 22 years. So there's victory in that, praise God. Amen. Well, anyway, go over to Proverbs 20. There's so much on this subject of growing old in righteousness that you'll just have to wait and get it when my book comes out. Proverbs 20, 29. The glory of young men is their strength. The airport in Atlanta this morning, I punched Darlene and I said, Darlene, there's the boss. Now, if you don't, if you never follow a professional football, you say, you wouldn't know who the boss is. But he's a, he's a defensive tackle for the Seattle Seahawks. And the guy is about six foot seven, probably weighs 280 pounds. Just, I mean, Mr. Solid, you know, he's a horse. You know, I mean, this guy, he's bigger than a horse. And he's one of the meanest defensive tackles in pro football. Well, there was the Boz. And, and uh, the Boz is not, I don't know his for real name. I've always just heard him called that. But the guy, as far as I can tell, I don't think he loves Jesus. You know, you, you can just look at him. And I don't think he loves Jesus. He's quite the opposite of humble. And we were sitting there looking at him. And Darlene just said, the glory of young men is their strength. But that passes so quickly. Our life is like a, a, a flower in the field. I have a hard time believing that I'm almost 40. It just seemed like yesterday that I was a little kid sitting at the end of the driveway playing with rocks. I mean, time slows down for no one. And it's a fact that the older you get, the faster it seems to go. I always heard that when I was younger. but. I and I thought that was funny. See, that was when I was sitting in school wanting it to go fast. But now that I don't want time to go so fast, it goes fast. But praise God, that might be their strength, is their beauty. Their strength may be their glory. But look at the next part of this 29th verse. And the beauty of old men is the gray head. You know why? It's because the gray head signifies wisdom and strength and maturity. That's right. Isaiah 46, 4. Sometime this weekend, I want to talk to you about the army of God. And I want to take you into the mighty men that served David. And also the tribes, the parts of the different tribes that joined themselves to him in the wilderness when he was hiding from Saul. And we'll look at their characteristics so that we can see what a well -run man for the Lord Jesus should look like or a well-rounded fighting woman because we're all called to this warfare this is kind of a setup for that because I want you all to see that just because we're all growing older and there are many of you who are who are have entered into your senior years that doesn't mean anything to the Lord you can be more victorious more powerful now than you have ever been before and that's why I want you often when I teach on the, the fight, the mighty men that served David and liken them to you and I today. Uh, I'm usually speaking to a younger crowd. And, but I want you to know that this is for everybody. There, in, the, in the spirit, there is no age. There is no age. And I want you to be, it's my heart to, if I do anything this weekend, I want to leave a deposit in you of a vision of seeing yourself a champion and a hero. Where are the heroes today? Where are they? Where are the mighty men? Well, let's go out there and show the world that they still exist. Mighty men and heroes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 46, 4. And even to your old age, I am he. And even to whore hairs will I carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. What a promise from God. I feel sorry for those who grow into their senior years without a knowledge of this. 
God's going to carry you. He's going to bear you up. And if He doesn't do it personally, angels are going to be there to bear you up. Whether you're young or whether you're old, they're going to be there to bear you up. I had a tree fall on me. I was sawing firewood a few years ago, and I had a tree that was that big around. And it fell across my legs. And my legs should have been pulverized. I just crawled out from underneath that tree and rejoiced because a limb that I had sawed off just five minutes earlier and had laid up here away from this other thing. So it was what you call a widow maker. The tree was standing like this and two big trunks, big trunk and about 15 feet in the air. Then two, that trunk split off, two big trunks. And I was, this one had fallen during a storm and the butt end of this one was up against its counterpart. And I was sawing limbs off of it down here. I wasn't expecting the thing to come down. It looked secure to me. And I've handled the chainsaw for years, and so I, you know, I, I know to look for those things. And so I sawed this limb off and laid it up the hill there about 10 yards or 10 feet. And it was laying flat. It was up there. There was no way it could have done what it did. And as I was sawing here, all of a sudden, I'm down. Just in a split second, I'm on my back. Chainsaw is laying here beside me. And the, and the log, this big around, is laying across my legs. Happened so quick, I didn't know what had happened. So I started squirming. Darlene screamed, Jesus. She was with me that day. And I started squirming, and I got out from underneath that thing, and we got to looking. And that limb that I had sawed off earlier and laid up the hill had been, in that split second, had been thrown down underneath right next to my legs so that when the weight of that log came down, it caught the weight of the, the weight of that log and kept it that far off my feet, my ankles, my legs. We got up and had a praise service right there. See, we believe in the power of God through His angels. We believe it. The Bible says in Psalm 37, I believe, you correct me if I'm wrong, might be Psalm 35, that He keepeth all of their bones, not one of them is broken. I can remember one, one morning I was sitting in my study and I was, I was reading the scriptures and I got over to that psalm and I claimed that. I said, Lord, I want to thank you that you keep all of our bones, not one of them is broken. And I went on back to reading and about five minutes later, my oldest son, who at the time was three years of age, fell down the steps. And we, have, we don't have carpet on our steps, they're hard oak floor. And he fell all the way down, boom, 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 all the way down about 15 steps. And... and I ran down there as quick as I could and picked him up with nary a bruise. I mean, we have seen this happen time and time again. The angels of God encamp around those that love God and fear Him and deliver Him. I want to know that now because I know I'll need to know it then. I'm going to need to know it as I'm older. Go with me, if you would, to Jeremiah. Chapter 5. Or let's go to chapter 12, verse 5. There's a principle here that I want to apply to the situation of growing older. Verse 5 of Jeremiah 12. If thou hast run with footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trusted they wearied thee, then how will you do in the swelling of Jordan? What this is telling us as we apply it to the subject of growing older and relying on the power and the strength of God is if when you're young, you're being wearied, running against just small obstacles, small enemies. If you're not taking the, the available blessings of God now while you're relatively young and learning how to use them and walk in them now and get victory now, then how are you going to do it when you're older? See, the swelling of Jordan... As I apply this to the subject of growing older, I look at the swelling of Jordan as being the time when we reach our older age. It seems like the big boys like to pile on the older you get. Now, I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be 88. You're remarkable. It's remarkable. It really is. It's a rarity to see someone as, as, who's 88 years of age that loves the Lord and is vibrant for the Lord and... See, I'm almost 40. I'll be 40 in a couple more years. and Already, I'm, I'm noticing that I'm not the man I used to be. I thought I'd always be able to climb to the top of any tree and shake a coon out. 
one of the things I did down in the mountains of Virginia, Brother Bill. And yeah, like, I, know, brother. <laughs> I was a coon hunter for many years. God had to deliver me of that. It was an addiction. I thought I'd always be able to hit a home run or score a dashing touchdown, but I'm finding out that, you know, you do get older. Now, it's true that we do get older, but we don't have to get old sick. But if I'm failing to rise up and defeat the enemies that would bring things on me now, then I can't expect myself to be able to get myself up 30 years from now and whip what he'll try to put on me then. So if I'm saying anything tonight, it's prepare today. Don't get worried running against footmen, because I want to tell you, in old age, you run against horses. But if you're successful in running against the footmen today, you'll be successful in running against the horses then. If you're successful today in a land of peace, it says, then you'll be fine when you, when you have to trod, as the Amplified Bible says, the tangled maze of jungle haunted by lions in the swelling of Jordan. See, there are lions in our old age. There are more lions in our old age than there are in our young age. But if we learn to take the things of God today and apply them diligently to our lives today, we can walk in victory then. Amen? Amen. And I believe with all of my heart that that's what God wants us to do. And I'm going to close with just a couple of things that you can do, how you can attain the strength, the vitality, and whatever you need to walk in a glorious old age and be fruitful and beneficial to those around you. Number one, seek wisdom first. Seek wisdom first. It's the first thing Solomon did when he became king is he sought wisdom. He didn't seek old age. He didn't seek riches, but he sought wisdom first. See. Wisdom is the principal thing. Ecclesiastes says, wisdom is profitable to direct. See, you're going to need direction. You're going to need the right direction to make the right decisions at all times. So you need the wisdom of God. Solomon prayed for the wisdom of God, and God said, all right, because you've asked for wisdom, he said, you've done a good thing. He said, not only, will Solomon, will I give you wisdom, but he said, I'll give you length of days. I'll give you a long life. And I want to set another thing straight here, and perhaps you all already know this, and if you do, that's fine. I'm just, I'm just encouraging you in it. But maybe you don't know this. You always hear people say, well, it must have been her time or his time to die. I don't buy that. Amen. Now, true, when we die, that is a time that we die. You know, I mean, if, if you don't die at a particular time, then I don't guess you die. Okay? <laughs> But there is not a preordained, determined time that you have to depart this scene. Because the, the Scripture does not support that at all. Quite the contrary. Through the book of Proverbs, the Bible says if you do this or this and this, you'll get length of days or years will be added to your life. What does it say in Psalm 91 at the end? That he who sets his love on me with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. All through the scriptures you see these precious promises that tell you that if you'll, if you'll just draw close to God, draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you, you're going to get what he is, and he's full of life. The closer you get to him, the more of his life you get, and it, it will combat old age for a long time. Eventually you will die, but you don't have to die sick and defeated. You don't have to die that way. If you're that way now, get healed and then die if you want to. Yeah. Right. Amen? You don't have to go the way of all flesh. There's a higher way for you to go. There's a more glorious old age for you than the way most people go. But you've got to do those things that are necessary to life. You've got to draw nigh unto God. And I want to tell you something. This is one of the hardest things for anybody, particularly the older you get and the more stuck in your ways you get, and the more unchangeable and unflexible you get. It's a danger. The older you get, it's easy to, begin, be, to get, inflex, or get fle inflexible and to think, well, I've arrived. You know, I don't See, the Bible says in uh, Psalm 55, it says that because they have no change, they fear not God. Uh -huh. 
See, you can always, no matter what age you are, you need to be changeable. Yeah. See, I want to tell you something. Our motto is constant change is here to stay. Okay? Be flexible because you don't know it. I don't care how old you are. You'll never know it all. And I want to tell you something. Just because we did it this way 20 years ago doesn't mean we're going to do it that way today. Right. And when I tell you something, I've made up my mind as a young man that when I get to the end of my leg of this relay race, when I reach back to hand the baton to my sons, my spiritual sons, I'm not going to require them to go back and run my leg in the race again. I'm going to let them do it the way God's showing them to do it, so long as it agrees with the Word of God. Because as we were talking about it today, you know, God's constantly recovering truth to the body of Christ. New things are coming forth. Not that they've never been, they've always been in the Word. It's just that we didn't see them. And we need to allow the younger generation that's coming on. You know, most of the things that have been recovered to the body of Christ in the last well, since Jesus went back to glory, have been recovered by younger men. Did you know the Puritans and the Pilgrims were not old men? The world paints them as old men, but they're, they weren't. They were younger men. Did you know that when Derek Prince and Don Basham and Brother Glenn Miller and them began to come through with the, with the deliverance ministry? That was 20-some years ago. 30, uh, how, how long ago? How many years ago was that? 25 years ago. How old were you 25 years ago? Forty-four is a young man. That's young. That's, a, that's young. God uses, primarily, is, is birthing new truth that's not in disagreement with the Word, but maybe we haven't seen it before. He uses young men to bring it forth. Now, the danger is for older men to say, nope, we didn't have it that way 20 years ago. We're not going to have it that way today. We need to watch that. We need to watch that. Because I'll tell you, God will move them right out of the way. As a matter of fact, I've had some of them who withstood what God's done through us die because they're withstanding God. It's a real danger. It's a real danger. We need to stay flexible. We need to say, all right, God, whatever you say, you show. If you can show me in the Word, Lord, I'll take it. I'll accept it. If it's in the Word, I'll take it. Bless God, we haven't done it this way around here, you know. It's the way we did it back 60 years ago is the only way to do it. No, it isn't. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, God says, Behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. He's a God of newness and freshness. Thank God for the old hymns. Thank God for the old choruses. But we also love the new ones. We use both. We don't want to be the kind that say, No, we're going to only sing the old hymns. We've got people in our neck of the woods who can't stand some of the songs we sing because they're, they're not like they're used to singing. That's all right. Let's go on to the new. Praise God. New worship songs coming forth. Amen. Well, anyway, let's be flexible. But we seek wisdom first. If we seek wisdom, then God's going to give us everything else we need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and His wisdom. I add that in there. It's not hard to do when you look at all the scriptures. 1 Kings 3, 7 through 14. Uh, Proverbs 3, 1 and 2. Proverbs 3, 13 through 16. These are scriptures that tell you to seek wisdom. It's the principal thing. It's just an example of Solomon seeking wisdom. And he got long life. It was offered to him. It was given to him. The only thing that messed him up was when he got off into false gods. All right. And number two, if you want to live longer, turn to 1 Peter 3.10. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. That rupture beneath your nose. There's an animal inside that rupture that'll get you in a whole lick of problems. Watch your tongue. First Peter 3, verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days. How many of you want to love life and see good days? All right. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. It's of utmost importance. We know the Bible says in Proverbs that life and death are in the power of the tongue. With life, with, with words, you can build life or you can kill life. You can support life or you can tear down. Speak that which is only good to the use of edifying. Speak forth the oracles of God. Confess the word over your life. Bind the devil every day. 
Don't act like he isn't going to bother you today. Because I want to tell you, he is. He hates you. Bind him up every day. I could go into many scriptures on this, but I'm not. You know them. Refrain your tongue from evil and your, spe- your, your lips from speaking guile. I want to tell you, it's a guileful thing to, to walk around and confess the enemy's victory over your life. You know, I, I come up to people different times. I, one man came up to me one time and he said, Oh, Brother Chip, he said, I'm under such warfare. I'm under such warfare. And I thought, well, you, you know, a lot of us are. Get your eyes off yourself. Amen. Stop thinking about yourself all the time. You know, other people are under warfare. Go, go help alleviate their problems and you're going to find that you'll be healed. You'll find that you're going to walk in more victory. You're going to find as you freely, as you have had it freely given to you, go freely give. And you're going to begin to see God come into great power in your life. We need to stop worrying about ourselves so much and get our mind out there on the harvest field and out there where people are sick and dying and defeated and they don't have any way out because they don't know the way out. We know the way. We're kingdom commandos. Let's go to them. Let's set them free and destroy enemy fortresses. Amen? Amen. Be a source of good sound advice is what I'm trying to say. Be a, good, a source of God's power to those in need. Proverbs or Psalm 32, 1 through 5. This is an important one if you want to grow old. Psalm 32, 1 through 5. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. Um, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 33 that when Moses died, it says his, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. You look in the margin of, of my Bible and it says his moisture was not abated. Or he had not lost his moisture. Now, you're going to see that word again here in Psalm 32, verse 4. But let's read through verse 5 from verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and who, in whose spirit there is no guile. See, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And he says, let, over in 1 Peter 3.10, he said, let him refrain his... His tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. You better make sure that you don't have guile in your heart. If you have it in your heart, it's automatically going to come out of your mouth. So praise God. Blessed is the man in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones... When I kept silence and I didn't confess my sins. That's what he's talking about. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Did you know that when you got strife and bitterness and hate and, and unconfessed sin and things like that in your life, that, that there's a roaring going on in your spirit? You might not realize it, but there's a roaring fire going on in there. There's an inner friction. An inner friction destroys you. That's what's destroying the devil right now. He's filled with a fire on the inside, an inner friction. It's destroying him. He's not growing stronger. He's just making the headlines. He's being destroyed by the very friction and roaring in him. This is what David says, I can't be this way. He says, because, he says, when I keep silent and I try to cover my sin and I try to act like I'm all right or I try to call sin something that's pretty decent or something that it's not, you know, and I try to cover up myself, my mistakes, my, you know. He says, when I do that, my bones wax old. He said, and there's a roaring all day long. For day and night... Your hand of displeasure. He's saying, God, your hand of displeasure is heavy upon me when I'm in sin. When I've got unconfessed sin or when I'm failing to deal with a particular sin once and for all. You're not pleased with me. And then he says, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. The Bible says when Moses crawled to the top of Mount climbed, he didn't crawl, he walked. To the top of Mount Nebo, it says, his eye was not dim. And that he hadn't lost his moisture. I believe that's what God has for us. We need to be quick to confess and repent of sin. And I want to tell you what repentance is. It's not being sorry only. It's being sorry for what you quit doing. That's a good definition. Repentance is being sorry for what you quit doing. If you haven't quit doing it, then you haven't repented. Now, I'm not saying you won't fall occasionally, but get right back up. Fall on your face before God and say, I am sorry, Lord God. I will not do this again. Repent and stop doing the things you've been doing. Praise God. Get busy now. 
Lay aside the sin and the weight that, that so easily besets you. Run with patience, constancy, that race set before you. You're going to make it. You're going to be all right. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter what the devil's told you. It doesn't matter what the doctor's told you. It doesn't matter what your family's told you. It doesn't matter how they did it. It doesn't matter that your mother had cancer. It doesn't matter that your mother had arthritis. It doesn't matter that your father had hardening of the arteries. You don't have to have it. If you've got that because they did, then you need to break that curse. They told me that my, my granddaddy, who worked in Norfolk, Virginia, he was a dispatcher for the fire department years ago. He had arthritis and walked with a cane. Well, that doesn't mean I have to. I broke the power of that curse. I've renounced my involvement in the occult. I've broken the power of all that, and I've driven those demons out of my life. Those things are, were hanging in me and vexing my heart, my soul, and my body, and my mind because of my involvement in them. Even, even my ancestors' involvement in those things. Doesn't matter to me, because I'm free of that now in the name of Jesus. I've broken the power of all that. I'm appropriating the blood of Jesus, and the name of Jesus, and the Word of God in my life. And you can do the same thing. That's what you want to do. As a matter of fact, I want to ask right now as we, as we close, is there anyone here that, that you've had sour stomach? Okay? A sour stomach. Anybody else? Okay? I'd like you to come up here. We're going to pray for you. Is anybody here that has had a headache? Okay. Same person, and you. Is anybody here that's been dizzy? Boy, I tell you, the Lord just, the Lord told me this before we even began tonight. Would you come up here? I feel like the Lord wants to, if, if any of these things have been bothering you, this is what the Lord told me that He wanted to minister to them tonight. And also, something I'd, after I pray for them, I feel like the Lord wanted us to minister to some folks that we that might have a spirit of premature aging. All I want to do, I, I don't feel like, if there's any, if there's any uh, reason, I don't know you folks, some of you, maybe it's your first time here, some of you have been here, I don't feel like having a deliverance service as such. I feel like faith has come in your heart tonight. You're going to get a chance to get in on some sessions tomorrow and the next couple of days on deliverance and you can examine yourself in the areas of, of the occult or unforgiveness or things like that you've been involved in. But I feel like your, that faith has come alive in your heart tonight as we've looked at the Word. And that all I need to do tonight is just lay my hands on you. And I'm going to release my faith. And if you'll release your faith, the power of God's going to drive out that affliction that, that I named. If it's dizziness, headache, sour stomach. I even feel like someone, somebody's got, uh, is having cramps in their stomach. Anybody out there having cramps in their stomach? The reason... Okay, you... Okay. Anybody else? Cramps in their stomach? Okay. All right. The reason I know that is the cramps just came in my stomach. And see, by Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. They're not mine. So then, if they're not mine, they're somebody else's. I don't receive them. Maybe if you're kind of guilty, maybe I give you my belly ache or something. No, you didn't give me no no way. You didn't give me any belly ache. I don't I don't accept belly aches or anything. I'm fine. I'm fine. That's just sometimes the Lord. I'll 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 feel something, and that's just the Lord will say, I'll know that hey, there's somebody here that's got that problem. That doesn't mean I got belly ache. And when you said belly ache, I go oh, maybe I gave yeah. it to him. <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, what I want to do is just lay hands on you. This is the end of this message. Our website is www lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.